this week's tutorial, we're going to take a look at the stop motion process and each of the things that you need to have on hand before you begin. So here we go. The first thing that you need are the armatures. Now these are located in the stop motion studio. There is a long armature and there's a short armature. There's actually two of each of these. And we'll talk about those later here in this tutorial in terms of why you would choose one versus the other. Next, you'll need your camera. Now, if you're doing the DSLR camera, which we recommend, you need the DSLR camera to work with Dragon Frame, for instance, uh, you need to check out the Canon 70D, 70D. Next thing that you need is a battery. Now, the battery should come with the camera. Uh, and also there should be a battery charger with the camera as well But it's very important that you make sure that you have them and that also the batteries are charged If you run out of the battery while you're working You'll need to have a backup battery to immediately swap to and then it's best to put the other battery on to charge Next thing you'll need is the USB cable that connects the camera to the computer standard USB cable with a USB mini B connector on the other end. The other thing you'll need is a screwdriver. Now this is one of the things that you may need to supply yourself. So make sure to have one on hand, it's a Phillips head screwdriver and also the screws. Now these screws are in the studio. Do not take them out of the studio. Make sure to leave them there. They are specifically made for the armatures and you will be screwing them into the MDF on top of the tables. And finally, you'll need your plasticine or modeling clay. We have this in the stop motion studio, so you don't need to necessarily bring your own, although you could if you want to, that's up to you. Make sure to leave whatever you've created behind. And with that, now we can get started. All right, so the very first thing that you need to do when you start this project is to take a look at the camera that you're gonna be working from. So this is the Canon 70D. This is the main DSLR camera that we will have you work with for this project. Um, the very first thing you should do when you get this camera is to check the lens. This is an all important but often overlooked part of the experience because on the lens, you may see dust or smudges or something that's going to obviously affect your overall quality of the image. So the best way to deal with any of those little imperfections is to have a microfiber cloth like what I have here, and then to just rub the surface very gently with that. Now, um, that will help you to get rid of any of the, the fingerprints or, or any, you know, smudgies that you might find on there. If you don't have a microfiber cloth, so long as your shirt is not really coarse, like this polo I'm wearing, it's a, it's a little bit coarse. It's like 100% cotton. Um, if, it, if it's something like a more synthetic fabric, some polyester, it's probably okay. Um, you could rub it with that, but you don't want to rub it with something too coarse because you don't want to scratch up the lens. But you do want to make sure that there's nothing on it, and that's a really important factor. Once you have that working, the next thing you want to do is to mount this onto the tripod. So I have a Manfrotto tripod here. Um, I'll pan down in a moment to show you uh, some of the features of it, but the, the, the tripod itself has a, a mount on it. And I'm going to quickly take that off. Now taking this mount off is not difficult, but it is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a gutcha if you don't know what you're doing. First off, there's a little screw on the side here to release the pressure on the mount. And then there's a button here that you have to press in order to get the mounting head to come off. All right, so that's, you press that to get it on and put it back. That's it, get it off and put it back on, okay? Now with this uh, mounting head, there's a screw right here. That's the silvery part. And then there's also a little, um, it's a, sort of an engraving in there. You may not be able to see it on the camera, but it says lens and it points in this direction, which tells you that that's the direction that you should mount this. Mount this, mount this side toward the lens on the camera. So you take your camera, it has a screw on the bottom right there, and then screw it in with the lens side pointed toward the lens. 
Okay? And it's just going to be finger tight. Okay? So it's pretty simple like that. It will look something like this once you've mounted it on there. And then to get it back on, we'll hold in that button again. We'll slide it into place. And then what we have to do is to retighten this knob, what we untightened before. Now, this little knob here, unfortunately, kind of hits the, the bottom of the camera there when we do it, so that's not ideal. Um, however, my way of dealing with that is to sort of put the camera a bit forward of that knob, tighten it until it's just about fully tight, all right? And then I can sort of, just in that last little section there, I might be able to get it to come forward and then something like that. It's a little bit, little bit off-center there, maybe. There we go, sort of moving the camera around a little bit while I do that. Um, different cameras sit differently on this, so it's not designed, obviously, for this specific camera, but you make things work. Um, a quick note about the tripod itself. All right, so if we take a, take a look at this here, I'll pan down with my camera. Um, the Manfrotto tripod has, uh, you know, it's three legs out, and what you're seeing here is I just have them up on only one of the two possible um, heights. So there are additional clips there where I could extend out those, those legs even farther, but I've only done it one, one length distance. So uh, that's all about you, what all you need, really, because what you can do, if I just uh, sort of tighten this in here, is we can adjust the height of the center part here. I'm gonna hold on to the camera while I do this just in case, but you can unscrew this part here and then this will allow you to, that will allow you right there to move uh, the swivel of the head. That's actually not the part that I wanted to move, excuse me. I wanted to untighten this part here, uh, which is just a knob. And what this does is it will allow you to move up and down this central mounting bar, whatever you want to call it. I don't know what you want to call that. Um, so that's, that's, that's important there. And what you do want to do, though, is to make sure that, the, that everything is level. And there is a level adjustment here on the back of the tripod. Um, you may not be able to see it on the camera very well there. I'll see if I can zoom in on it. Sorry, I'm doing this uh, manually by myself here, so it's not the, <laughs> not the most accurate way of, of showing something. All right, but there is a, um, right here is a little levels adjustment, and it's got a little bubble in it, it's got a circle. What you want is the bubble, obviously, to be in the middle of the circle. And uh, ways we can adjust that, obviously, if the legs are not at the same height, uh, then that's going to be uneven. Uh, but what you can do is, as I had shown before, is if you unscrew this part down here, I'll, I'll zoom out a little bit again so we can see the whole thing. But if you unscrew this part here at the bottom, now everything at the top is going to swivel around. So you can really see that it's moving around there. And then you can use that to line up the, the bubble into the circle, which it looks good right there. And now I know that everything is level. And that's going to be really important because I don't want my, uh, my stop motion to be lopsided. All right. And if you need to adjust anything else, um, there are additional things on the tripod that you can, you can adjust. Obviously, um, on the side here, this is sort of a tilt adjustment. When you get the tripod initially, this arm will probably be down. So usually, this, when this gets stored inside the tripod case, this arm here goes down. I'll stand away from it so you can see it a little bit better. And then you just have to untighten this to pull it up and then retighten it so that you can then use that as a, a way to move the camera around. You probably won't need to move the camera after you have actually put it into its final place. Um, and then there are some additional adjustments here for being able to move things around, I can, um, if I were to, try, I always have to kind of go through this myself because I don't always remember which, what every one thing is here. So might, all 
there we go. <laughs> Had to find it. Um, there's, a, there's a knob here in the, in, right under the front of the camera, which if that's tightened, then you can't rotate for this from uh, side to side, but if you untighten that, now you can. So, all right. So those are the, the main little features there, and these, these tripods are quite nice. I uh, definitely recommend that you use the, this is the, the, there are different types of Manfrotto tripods, and this is uh, an important thing that I wanted to kind of acknowledge as well, is that um, these ones are the Manfrotto video tripods, and they're a lot more advanced and a lot more, uh, I think they're a lot more adequate than just the standard Manfrotto photo tripods. So when you check these out from Lone Central, uh, I recommend that you go for the Manfrotto video tripods. All right, the next thing we're gonna do is to try to set up our camera to be able to film our stage, essentially. And one thing I wanna point out right now is just because of the way things are set up here, I have a computer set up on the end of this table. That won't be the case for you when you're recording in here. Um, it's just because we're kind of in the middle of setting up the entire studio, and this is just for my purposes right now. I'll be using all of, this, all of this area where you can't see the computer or any of the peripheral devices. Okay, so we have the camera, the D70, on the tripod here. So we're gonna turn it on, and the nice thing about the D70 is it has this little flip-out panel here which allows us to be able to see the scene, and I can kind of show that to you a little bit here. Um, what we wanna do is to uh, set this up so we can actually see what's on the screen. And right here on the camera is a start stop button. On to the left of that is a red video icon and to the right of that is a white photo icon. And we're gonna move the switch to the white photo icon and then press start stop. And by doing that now we can actually see the preview of what the camera is seeing there. Um, so what we would probably need to do is to adjust the height of the post here on the tripod until it's sitting nice and evenly with our, uh, with our ball. You can kind of see the ball there. It's a little green dot. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here so we can better see what we're, what we're working from because we're going to want to um, ultimately uh, make this nice, crisp, and clean. So we can start that way by first... Uh, maybe what we want to do is angle down a little bit here. So let's move the tripod down just a little bit. Or I could also physically move it down. Uh, but I'm going to zoom in there again so I can actually really see that ball. Yeah, I think I will move this down a little bit. Just physically. There we go. Cool. And so it's really fuzzy. Super, super fuzzy. And that's because what I need to do is to take there's two different adjustments on the lens. There's a macro adjust, which is the big one that I just moved. That's, that's adjusting the actual focal length. And then there's this micro adjustment wheel. And that's what we want to be able to see our ball. Now, um, that's, that's become a lot better, but I can't really tell just by looking at it if that is truly in focus or not, because it's still too far away for me to see on that screen. So there are a couple helpful features on the camera. There, onto the very right side, top right side of the camera, are a couple buttons here that are a magnifying glass with a minus sign and a magnifying glass with a plus sign. And if I press the one with the plus sign, what that's going to do is it's going to digitally magnify the image on the screen here. And I can do that a couple times, and I can really see that that's still very fuzzy looking there. So now that I can see that, I can make that adjustment here until I can start to see some nice crisp details. I can see my thumbprints in there and, and, and all that. So that looks much better. And that's gonna be a good, um, uh, correct, nice and focused image. Great thing is, is that if I adjust only the macro focus now and pull back, everything will remain uh, at the same level of focus that I just created. So that's good for us. What I wanna do is I wanna take this and put it at approximately uh, a focal length of about 80, somewhere in there. Um, so that's pretty good. And I also want to take a look at this image overall. Right now I can see the white of the table, um, then the MDF, right? So the white of the table there, then the MDF, and then the stage itself. So I'm gonna make a couple small adjustments here so that um, I'm only seeing 
maybe just either the very bottom of that MDF. Yeah, something like that. Not seeing any of the white of the table now. This way I have enough room for the ball to jump higher, <laughs> essentially. And if I needed to, if this distance here is not right, I could pull the camera back farther um, and I might actually decide to do that. Now that's gonna, that's gonna wreck my, uh, my focus that I just tried to uh, create, but I could redo it very quickly, um, which I will do again, just pressing that plus button, plus button, and using my micro adjustment, that looks good. Okay, and then just going to realign this. And what I wanna do with all of this, the, the, the area that you decide to place this into is very important and you won't know yet if this is the right distance until you start to analyze your, uh, your footage inside a dragon frame using, the, um, using the, the pencil test that you created because uh, what you're gonna to need to do is to verify that you have enough room for the entirety of your animation. Since your animation is going to uh, mimic exactly what you did with the pencil test, you need to make sure that there's enough room at the beginning and basically on the left side and the right side of your, of your image here to accommodate the full width of your animation. Otherwise, you're gonna run out of space and that's not gonna work for you. So. Um, this is just some of the basic thinking process of setting this up. Now, um, a couple other important things to mention, which I've also mentioned in the presentations before, is that the, uh, the buttons on the actual lens itself, you'll see that there's a button here for AF versus MF, which is autofocus versus manual focus. That should be on the manual focus option. And the option for stabilizer, which is on or off, should be set to off. Um, and I think that in terms of getting started, that that's fine. The only one thing that I wanna do is to point out that once you do know exactly where your um, camera is going to be, right? Once you have figured that out, and we haven't totally figured it out at this stage, but I'm just telling you uh, within the context of this video, once you know exactly where that's gonna be, what you need to do is to have a sandbag, right? These are you know, these sandbags from Lone Central. And what I would do is I would put this um, around one of the legs, maybe around the, the, the front leg there. And that way, it's much more difficult to accidentally move the tripod or the camera. Uh, that's to prevent somebody accidentally knocking it while you're trying to shoot everything, because obviously that's gonna make things un, uneven between frames. There is one more important thing just to mention before I move on to the next step. And that is simply, we need to take the USB cable that comes with your camera and connect it to the computer. So I plug the USB cable into the back of the computer there. And then we have this uh, USB mini uh, B cable. And that needs to plug into the side of the camera here. And this way we've obviously connected camera and computer because that's a, very necessary step in terms of getting Dragon Frame to communicate with our camera. Here is the pencil test that's been saved out as an image sequence. And as we take a look at each of these different frames, what we're seeing, of course, is that the ball is changing shape over time. Now, if we were to animate this with stop motion, one way that we could do it is by physically changing the shape of the ball on every frame, but that is not necessarily the most practical way of doing it. The more practical way of doing it would be to look at the different types of frames that we have and then to decide on what are the various shapes that we're going to need. Obviously, we're going to need a round shape, which is what we have here already, but we're also going to need a flat shape. We're going to need a shape for when the ball actually hits the ground. And we return to that shape several times in, you know, the first time it's a bit more flat, the next time it's a bit less flat. But it's good to have prepared ahead of time a shape that's going to basically be our ball when it is flat. And another shape that's good to have is, of course, going to be our stretched shape. Now, that shape can be a little bit tricky to make because it's, it's not, you know, <laughs> it's a bit of an egg shape. And so 
what I've done is with each of these here, these were modeled from about the same amount of, of plasticine. So they are roughly the same volume. And uh, you know, there some care is taken to try to make them round, but just you can see it's a little bit of a little imperfect there. It's it's okay so long as it's mostly clearly round. Um, for this for this egg one, what I have here is uh, something that looks a bit more like this. It's not gonna it's not really gonna stand up there very well. Probably it might fall over, but um, and I could I could take a little bit more care with that. I could uh, brush the edges a little bit more there with my finger to just try to get the the shape to be a bit more rounded or teardrop, if you want, something like that maybe. And that's probably gonna change over time as well. So we'll be swapping out between these different shapes as we go along throughout this sequence. Um, and if we had any other shapes, for instance, if you had a shape where you were having the balls um, you know, drastically change or morph into something else, then you'd want to have versions of those as well. Um, it's a lot simpler and a lot faster to swap between you know, <laughs> two things than it is to try to sculpt the round ball into a flat shape and then a um, teardrop shape and then a round shape again back and forth. So just some basic planning ahead before you even get started. And you can even have somebody who is working on um, creating these different shapes after you've begun shooting, so long as you have some of the initial shapes already ready for the first however many frames of the sequence you are prepared to animate. And then that other person can continue creating um, new shapes as needed, uh, just in time for you to use them. They can also be responsible for making sure that the ball remains round. It is quite possible that these things do get a little bit um, messed up over time, you know, and maybe we want to make this one not so flat anymore. We'd want to sort of push it in a bit. So we can't really see what I'm doing there with my hands, but push it in a bit and sort of round it off. And so now it's still flat on the bottom, but it's a little bit, a little bit bigger than it was. Maybe try to make that a bit more even there on the top. It's kind of hard to do that on camera. Um, so there, that's the, that's the basic idea of this step. All right, so we're gonna start by opening up Dragon Frame, which is available on the two computers that are inside the Stop Motion Lab. When you launch Dragon Frame, you are going to get the option to create a new scene. There may not be existing projects already uh, recorded with Dragon Frame if this is the first time you've been using it. And what we are going to do is just create a new scene. And it's going to ask you, obviously, for a name of this. We'll call this, the little example I'm going to do is a bouncing ball project. You might call yours Bnob or something similar, right? I'm just going to call mine bouncing ball. You can see that you can only get a, um, about five letters in there, so I'm just going to call it B-ball for mine. Scene 01, take 01, that's fine. Important, let's make sure that the frame rate is set to 12 and click OK. And then it's gonna ask us where we want to save all of the imagery that gets captured by our camera. Um, I created a folder on my desktop called DF for Dragon Frame. So I'm just gonna select that folder. And now we have our uh, Dragon Frame window open to us. What we wanna do is to make sure that the uh, camera and uh, Dragon Frame are properly connected. So the very first thing I'm gonna do is to come over here into the very top right side, you'll see that there are different panels. We have an animation panel, and then we have a cinematography panel, which I'm gonna click on. And currently it says there's no live view. And that's because my camera is not turned on. So it is connected to the computer via that uh, USB cable. So I'm gonna turn it on. And once it loads up, then we should start to see some kind of uh, preview that pops up here inside of uh, Dragon Frame. All right, so. There we go. Now we can see it. And putting my hand in front of it so that we can see that it actually is live. Okay, so this gives me some information. First off, it will kind of tell me whether or not the framing is correct. Um, it also is giving me an indication of is the brightness correct, is, is, is the basic uh, layout good. And um, what we're gonna do is inside the cinematography panel, we're gonna play around with uh, some of the 
camera settings that sit down here. So by default, the picture style is probably set to standard. Um, I generally put this to something like faithful. It probably doesn't really make that much of a difference, but I'll just do that. Image quality, we're gonna save these as a large fine JPEG. When you're doing more advanced work, you may also wish to save out into raw format as well. You can see that there are some raw uh, formats there, but large fine is good. That's gonna be basically a, uh, uh, a nice um, large JPEG file. The white balance, this, is, this one is important. Um, we want to make sure that this is set to color temperature because if we get this wrong or we're doing like auto or um, you know the wrong shade there, now everything looks really weird compared to the actual lighting in the room. So we're gonna set this to color temperature because if we do that, then we can specify the exact color temperature in Kelvins, right? So K there for Kelvins. And um, can mess around with this a little bit until it looks more like what we are seeing in the room itself. So that is probably pretty close there. So 4,400K, this is dependent on my position in the room. It's probably gonna be somewhere between about 3,900 to 4,400K uh, when you are shooting. Uh, external flash, we don't need to worry about that. Stretch, don't need to worry about that. And exposure preview offset, we don't need to worry about that. But the things that we do get to worry about are these interactive adjustments. Now this is really cool. What, what I get to do here is as I adjust these values, you'll notice that uh, the image gets brighter. What I'm doing here inside a dragon frame is actually adjusting the settings on my camera, uh, which is really quite neat, I think. So you don't actually have to go over to the camera and touch it to make any changes. I can sort of interactively do it here directly inside the software. Um, now what this is, as we're looking at this here, is this is, says 15, and what that means is it's 1 15th of a second. And that is a pretty, um, a pretty quick shot overall, um, but it, you know, if there is any jitter or anything like that, it will be obvious. Now what I just heard happen on my camera, and if I put my hand in front of the camera now, you'll notice that uh, we're not seeing that. It says live view inactive. Uh, the camera has just switched off. And that's because, as far as the camera is concerned, I haven't done anything for at least a minute. And what's important then is to, on your camera, uh, and I can't show this in the video right now, but you would, you would uh, come back and turn your camera back on. You can just press the start stop button on the camera. You don't have to physically turn it off and then back on again. Um, but you would want to go into the menu and find the option for um, the length of time before the, it goes to the auto turn off feature, uh, which it says here, if I can find it real quick. Doo, doo, doo. Auto power off is currently set to uh, four minutes at the moment. That's, that's for me. You can set this to uh, eight minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, disable, right? Um, for what we're doing here, it's probably good to uh, maybe not put it to disable, but I might wanna put this down to like uh, 15 minutes or so. And that will, that will definitely make it um, a lot easier for me to, to, to work here. All right, um, and then I can exit out of my menu. All right, now um, what I want to do is to get this to relink to the camera, because at the moment we're not seeing anything. And if I come over here, there are some options for um, getting the live view. If I press this button right here, now I get my live view back, which is good. Um, so if you lose it, you can get it back here doing this. The, uh, what we were doing before is we were adjusting the frame rate, um, so the, basically the click speed, if you will. And you'll notice that that definitely brightens things up, but uh, I don't necessarily want it to be probably any slower than 1 15th of a second. Um, I'm limited now in terms of the aperture. 
If I make this aperture higher, you notice that the image is going to get darker. So we're going to take this down to basically the lowest we can take it, uh, which is going to be 5.0 uh, or an f5.0. And then our other option here is going to be ISO that we can adjust. So with the ISO, uh, the maximum ISO we probably want to go to is about 400. That does definitely brighten up our image quite a bit. Um, but it comes at the cost of uh, adding more graininess into the image. So I usually would put this somewhere around probably 320. So these settings here um, are probably pretty good for us. And we could go in and do a test shot on this. But before I do that, I want to go in and just check uh, the quality of my uh, actual focus. And I can do that by clicking and dragging on this rectangle here and then clicking on the little crosshair that's next to it. There we go. And this is going to give me a live interactive zoom as well. So this is really cool. Um, these little buttons here are for the, the granularity of that zoom. So if I press the, the big ones, uh, we're going to zoom out a lot or go back in the opposite direction. And then we have some more finer, finer tuned kind of controls. And so I'm going to press these until I get a solution that I think looks pretty good, where I can really see the fingerprints and such. And uh, don't want it to go too far in the wrong direction. Right, so that looks pretty good right there. And uh, now, now that I've done that, uh, I'm happy with that. I can exit out of this by pressing this button here. And now I have a nice, perfectly crisp image for my scene. So that's a pretty good start. What we want to do as well, though, is to make sure that this setup here, where the, where the bounds are, if you will, where, where my hand starts here and then where the scene ends over here, is the, uh, is the right width. And that's going to be heavily dependent on matching my uh, camera setup to the pencil test that you created. So to check that, what we will want to do is to come over here into the cinematography, sorry, into the animation um, tab. And we are going to bring into this a media layer. Right now, what we can see, for instance, is the whole image. I'm going to zoom out there a little bit. It's a little bit big. You can see the whole image there. And um, remember, we're going to be creating a layout that's a 16 by 9 aspect ratio. You can change that down here if it's not set to 16 by 9. And at the moment, we're seeing that 16 by 9 overlaid on top of the original image. If I pull down this aspect ratio mask, you'll see that the whole image is available there when I do that. Right? So this is more of a, a 4 by 3 image um, initially. And when I put this in here, this mask, it shows me what, what that uh, cutting will do, which is really important because this is our final output. This is going to be what we use for our HD output. All right, so now we're going to bring in a media layer by clicking on the plus sign here. And we're going to load an image sequence. Now what I've done, just to show you so that you are aware before we start with this, that's not the, uh, not the video that I want there, um, on my desktop, actually I'm going to have to go into the user menu and then go to my desktop. All right, I have a image sequence. And uh, this image sequence here is saved directly out of Krita. And it's very important that you are able to do this, that you have separate images. Here you see each one of these is um, you know, a different image, a different uh, file. And this is what we're going to bring into DragonFrame as our guide, essentially. Um, we've already talked about creating uh, different shapes for your um, basically different uh, models of clay for each of these different shapes. And we're going to bring this in because it, we, we have a frame here, an image, a drawing, for every frame that we are going to be animating inside of Dragon Frame. So um, I just have that folder here. I'll just copy the address to that folder. And we'll go here, we'll choose Load Image Sequence. And now, this is actually already linked to that. So I'm going to click on the first frame. 
in that image sequence and choose open reference image sequence. And now, as you can see here, if I click on any given frame, what we're seeing is the, uh, the image sequence there. It's sitting on top of our actual view. So this is something that we would want to uh, play around with. It looks like I had um, also loaded in a separate thing here at a different time. So I'm going to probably uh, delete that one. Um, I'll just turn down the opacity there for now. Um, oh, actually, sorry. Excuse me. <laughs> what we're seeing there, that, turn down the opacity on this. What I was doing here is this is just the actual um, uh, image of our background. <laughs> we don't want to turn that off. Sorry. Got confused there for a second. Um, but our bouncing ball here, you can see, yep, that definitely can be moved around. There's a couple things, obviously, uh, need to take into account. The size of the ball here is uh, quite a bit smaller than the size of the ball for our camera. And we, we do need those to be the same because when we watch this, this, this whole animation, it starts on the left side and ends on the right side. The, the animation, the, the, the pencil test bounds us. And so we need to make sure that our ball here is the same size as it is here. Now, that doesn't mean we physically need to um, change the size of the ball. It just means we need to change the location of where the camera sits. Um, so if, if we just take this like frame by frame, we can see that by the end of the animation here, if we zoom out a little bit on the, um, the scale of the, the animation uh, here, sorry, it's this, this one here, all right, and get to the end. By the time we're done, there it is. It's sitting over there at the end, and that's basically more or less the end of that animation. So what we're going to do is let's find a frame where this ball looks like it's pretty much on the ground there. It's a little bit easier for us to, um, to judge something like there. Um, and I can, I don't want to move the whole thing there. I want to just move my um, bouncing ball layer. So I click on that. And then, oops, go back over to that frame. There we go. Uh, we're going to put that right about there because that's going to match kind of with our ground. And so what I'm physically going to do here is to uh, pull back with my, um, oh, I'm going to move my sandbag because that's, that's locking me in into place so sandbags are effective. And we're going to pull back quite a bit farther here until our ball is around about the right scale. And this means that we are actually going to be fairly far away. We may need to adjust the height of, of things. This is a little bit closer. Um, so I'm going to move my, um, adjust the, the, the center bar there so that this thing rises up a little bit more. There we go. All right, something like that. Okay, and now we need to play around with some of that focal adjustment. Um, I can come back into the cinematography panel here, um, click on our um, little crosshair here, come back in and manually adjust this. There we go. Um, so click, click, click. Kind of do larger scale adjustments until we get closer. All right. Now we can do some fine tuned ones. And that looks about, about right. Because the camera is farther back, we don't see quite as much detail as we did before, but that's just going to be the nature of the beast. Okay. And so that is in focus. Um, what I will do, however, is probably uh, rotate the, um, or sort of pan up just a tiny bit there. Again, trying to get rid of that white part of the table. So it's a little bit of a process, but you'll get it. And then when you have that set where you want it to be, put the sandbag back. Um, again, this, just confirm that this looks about right. It's, um, it's not 100% perfect. You can see that the, uh, the ball here is a little bit, 
the, the, the pencil test ball is a little bit smaller, so I could continue doing this. I mean, so I would uh, be nice if this had some wheels, but it doesn't. So I'm just going to pull it back a little bit until we get it about there. And if you have a team of people helping you out, it's a lot easier to do this because they can kind of work together to tell you if you've gone too far or not far enough. Okay, so that's looking a little bit better. Again, do that, come back in, reassess the focus because that's going to be an important thing. Oops. And I'll probably just be a fairly minor adjustment this time. Somewhere in there. All right, and um, that should get us set up. So with all this set up here, obviously you really want to make sure that uh, there is no, uh, nobody's gonna move your setup and that uh, you're, you're good to go. So let's, let's take a look at uh, the beginning and ending of this. We kind of know where the floor is gonna be now. So we're just dragging our pencil test so that the floor corresponds with where the, the bottom of our ball is essentially at the moment, because that's going to need to be locked into place. All right. And now we can just say that essentially when the, when the animation begins, the ball is going to need to be in uh, the air here, and then it's going to move and bounce accordingly throughout all of this. All right. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of room at the top perhaps more room than we need. And uh, you could, if you wanted to play around with that, you could move, we could, we could perhaps move the, um, the central peg down a little bit more so that, yeah, we, we, run, into the, we run into some of the hazards of, um, their, of, of seeing the, the, the white of the table underneath there. We don't necessarily want to see that. Um, I'm sure I, I'm just kind of adjusting this so that it's nice and level. Um, but I might be able to move this down a little bit like that, and then maybe uh, change this up here a little bit. So I am going through the whole kind of process with you just to show you um, like the little finessing that you will need to do to get this right to begin with, which is why this is not really something that's very easy to show directly in the, in the classroom itself because it's a little bit finicky, right? So what we also want to make sure of is that we're not seeing any part of the table we don't want to see. Like we're not seeing the, uh, the awkward edge over on the far side. Um, so yeah, something like this, this should probably work out reasonably well, and I will go through and yet again, just uh, kind of reconfirm, like where is, where is my, um, there we go, so that's my ground now. <laughs> I could actually, I can move this up a little bit higher here. So the ground might sit farther back if I wanted it to, I can give myself a little bit more space, but probably not too far back. That, that as well is going to also have an impact on how big this ball appears to be. Like if I move this ball farther back, we could make it look a bit smaller too. And that's without having to move the camera. This is probably pretty good. Um, and getting our ground now assigned there. You'll see that um, it's a little bit at an awkward angle there. So that's, again, that's about just adjusting the camera until you can get that at a nice angle. And this is what I mean over here. Oops, you can't really see it, but there, we don't want to see that awkward angle at the edge of the frame. So somebody having the computer closer to you, having the monitor closer to you makes this a lot easier to do. I think that's pretty good. I think that will work for us. All right. Um, so one last time, again, 
It's uh, learning through repetition. And there we go. Looks pretty focused there. Cool. All right, great. Um, so now, as we play through this, we would expect that the ball is going to continue on that pathway there. And this distance that you have created now is, is going to be where your uh, ground is going to need to remain. Because remember, we're doing everything here just from a side view. So that distance from here to here should be the same the whole time. Um, as we continue on with this, we will, uh, you know, you could use a, a ruler if you wanted to, to really make sure that you have um, a good distance there. I don't have a ruler with me at the moment, unfortunately. So I'm gonna eyeball it. But one of the things that we will probably need to continue doing is to, um, as, we're, as we're animating this ball over time, um, is to uh, go in and, and constantly readjust our focus like I was just doing. So that's a pretty common part of this process as well, is to ensure that the objects are remaining in focus. And one other thing that I'm going to point out is that this is sort of an, a simplified example because um, I'm only going to be working with one armature, whereas you will be working with multiple armatures, two armatures most likely at the same time, and uh, you need to place them appropriately in the, in the shot. So the next thing that we're going to take a look at is um, setting up the armatures. What you can see here is that we have two different kinds of armatures that we're going to be working with for this project. There are uh, two of these longer ones and two of these shorter ones that you can choose from. And there's no right or wrong or reason for choosing one versus the other. The, the main thing is, is that the one that's a bit longer here can be adjusted to move a ball um, a bit farther over in the scene without actually having to uh, adjust its, its location on the board. And so this one here is a little bit better suited to um, a ball perhaps that's going for smaller movements. Um, it's not moving quite as far. And we are really only going to use the armature when the ball is suspended in midair or if it has to, for some other reason, um, need something to hold it up so that it sits correctly. Uh, a couple important things to think about here. First off, knowing exactly where the bounds are of your animation. That's, that's very important because we are going to be placing these armatures in the scene based on that. Um, so we, we do have that correctly aligned here. What we want to ensure, and I'm going to use the larger one for this because I'm just going to be doing a single um, example here. I'm just going to be doing a single uh, ball moving, is that uh, the armature itself, the base of the armature, is not in the shot. I will want the base of that armature to be sitting essentially on the ground of my uh, pencil test. And however, I don't want it to be in the shot. So I'm going to take this, and what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to reverse it around so that the, the base itself is going to sit over here. Now, uh, I am going to end up screwing this into the MDF, and that's why the MDF is here, um, is that you can screw, the, uh, screw these into it. And we only, there's, there's four holes here, um, but we only need to really screw in a single screw. Uh, that one is good enough. It will do all of the work that we need it to do. And so what you will need is a screwdriver. Um, the screws are provided. Please do not take the screws with you. There's a bag of them. Okay, but um, really, we only need one at a time. And it doesn't really matter where you put it. Um, but so long as we're screwing this in somewhere by hand, just off camera with this sitting on the same plane as our ball. All right, so let's move that over here. All right, and I'm going to screw that in now. And just kind of move that out of the way while I do that. Um, these screws are, are not 
um, long enough to actually screw past the MDF that's on these tables. I tested that out specifically. All right, and uh, so you don't need to worry about them, go, you know, gouging into the table or anything like that. So if you get that in there pretty strong, it's not really going to move unless you apply a lot of force to that foot. Um, and now you can much more easily adjust all of the motion of these little arms. And these arms will stay in position quite nicely. If there's any difficulty with that, then um, what probably needs to happen is that these, these little um, uh, screws on there, they're hex screws, um, or not screws, whatever these things are called. I'm not a mechanical person, sorry. Sorry to anybody out there who really knows what they're doing uh, when it comes to mechanical things, but um, you need a Allen wrench or a, or a um, hex wrench to be able to adjust those, which I just so happen to have as well for this. Um, again, these are in the Motion Capture Studio. Um, please don't leave with them. So if, for instance, you got a part here that's just really <laughs> hanging down because it's not tight enough, uh, you can tighten that back up with one of these little uh, Allen wrenches here. Uh, and uh, if you need it to be, you know, if you've got something heavy, that may, you may need to make those adjustments a little bit just so that everything is um, just that much more precise. Okay. Um, the, these armatures are rated to only kind of hold at most 350 grams at any one time. So we're not trying to overweigh them or over, overload them. Um, and yeah, so um, in terms of mounting the, uh, the ball to one of these, there's a couple different ways you could do it. Um, some people like to do it with plasticine itself. So what you could do is take some of the same plasticine that the ball is made out of. And uh, here I have a, a, bag of, a bag of this plasticine. Um, and you just take a little bit of it. You don't need a lot, just enough that you could stick here onto that, that nib at the end there. Um, if the plasticine is sticky enough, this can work. If it's not, if it's a little bit older, it may not work the best. Uh, but then you could use that as a way to kind of hold the ball there. You can see that a little farther out that that is, the more likely it is to pull it down. Um, that's one way to do it. And if you use just the right amount, you won't be able to see kind of that excess plasticine that you stuck on there. Um, another way to do it, which is a bit more brute force, um, this comes down to to what extent we will ever need to see kind of um, the backside of the uh, the ball here. So uh, in this case, probably we're not really too worried about that. We could technically take this little this little end bit here, kind of angle it a bit more toward uh, toward camera, and you know physically put the ball onto that, sort of gouge that in there. You can see it like that, sort of gouged in there. Um, and that's another way to keep it nice and in place. Don't have to worry about it falling off the plasticine now. Um, but yeah, that's really gonna be dependent on, your, um, on, on the needs of, of your particular story. What you wanna try to avoid is uh, where possible is like, you know, seeing unnecessary parts of the armature itself. So we try to keep everything kind of hidden there as much as possible. Later on, we will need to go through and physically edit out the armature from every frame of this that we create. Okay, um, so let's go in. We'll do it this way for now. You can use plasticine if you want, but I'm just gonna keep it really simple for my purposes at the moment. This is mostly round, keep an eye. <laughs> Somebody should be kind of like looking at this just to make sure that it still looks like the right shape. You can see it's a little bit blobby, unnecessarily blobby there at the bottom. And again, we're wanting to make sure that this is sitting on the floor correctly. So put the floor back up. And if I 
move this down now. You can see that, there it is. Okay, good. Just wanting to make sure that everything is kind of angled correctly because it is possible very easily to get this um, at the wrong angle. And now at the start here, that's just, uh, just adjusting things on the armature to kind of pull it into a starting position. Right? And that will hold there now. That's gonna be my, my, vis my visual start. Uh, but one last time, I know I keep doing this, but this is really kind of a essential part of the process. I'm gonna make sure that this is actually focused. Um, and if it falls out of focus, it'll probably be out of focus like just a tiny, tiny bit. So it may not be that noticeable. Um, but it's best to kind of like check in every few frames just to ensure that it hasn't gone crazy. Okay, so um, we can get started now. We have this lined up for our first frame. We are now in the actual uh, animation section here, and we are going to be recording here on this layer, which has the camera icon. So if we got our uh, ball lined up correctly, we can take the photo, by just pressing enter. Now, a really important thing before you take that photo, though, is to make sure that in no way are you somehow entering into the shot. You know, like, you know, having the hand in the shot is obviously one way, but if somebody is standing a little bit too close to it and they start casting a shadow, then that's gonna be entering into the shot as well. So be aware before you begin. Try to not be blocking your camera in any way, okay? And uh, so with that in, in place, go back here so we can kind of see that, uh, that bouncing ball. We'll just press enter and that will take the photo. You can see we get our first photo there. Um, now it automatically advances to the next frame and now we can move our ball to match that. And as you can probably tell, hit press enter again, the fact that we have this pencil test is truly a blessing because otherwise, how would we know where to place things? Okay, so now we go into this more teardrop shaped one. So I'm gonna take the, take that off there and I'm gonna replace it with my, my teardrop. Okay, and it's not the best looking teardrop, but we'll, we'll use it for now. You can do better. I'm just doing this for the sake of, uh, for the sake of the example at the moment. Try to align that to the same angle. We'll, instead of a teardrop, we'll just call this a turd. It kind of looks like a turd. <laughs> uh, we'll press enter again, save that one. And now, now we have our squashy ball. Okay, so we don't want this in the shot at all for this because we don't need it. Uh, we're gonna put our squashy ball on our floor. I'm trying to move this here uh, so that they align. I'm just looking at the screen while I do that. And there you go, we might need to move that back. Sort of just pushing it back a little bit here. All right, that's pretty good. Um, it's probably a good time to come in here, especially since I've been swapping out the, um, the different um, models. It's probably a good time to come in here and, and verify that uh, this is still in focus, so. It was, that's good news. Um, so we'll press enter. Okay. And now take that one out. Now we bring back our turd. Um, and we're just gonna move this around a little bit. So I'll take it off there and I'll put it in this direction. Um, you probably would reshape this a little bit. You know, each time you do this, you, it's not gonna be quite as uh, elongate as it was before. And put it back, put it back on here. Uh, get that aligned. Get it rotated properly, something like that. Okay, again, I'm gonna check my focus on that because I've, I've been pressing into it. So I don't know if I've accidentally pressed into it too hard and moved it too far back or, or, or something, so. Always a good idea to check. That's probably pretty good. Um, and press enter. Okay, and this is just how we continue through this. It's, it's quite
quite, uh, quite straightforward. Now, I am animating one object. However, as you do this, you will have most likely two blobs in your scene at any one point, which means that you will need to be animating both of them at the same time, right? So the amount of adjustment that you give to one frame versus another, like I would be adjusting this ball here and then I'd probably have another ball over here that I would still need to be using another armature to move around or maybe it's just, you know, it might be rolling on the ground or something like that. Um, that's, that's what I would need to do in that case. And so um, this is just how we get started with it. So again, back to confirming our focus. All right. By the end of this, you'll just get really tired of me talking about focus, but it's so important. Enter. And the remainder of this now is going to be primarily um, just more of the same. So I'm, I'm probably going to do a bit of a speed through video now. The, um, what happens if you make a mistake? All right, let's say that, let's say, oop, I'm going to, I pressed enter there, but that wasn't where I wanted my shot to actually be. So if I go back to that frame, okay, um, I can see, oops, it's not quite where, it's not quite aligned. Well, what I can do is I can right click on that. I could delete it. Um, I could reshoot it. Okay. So uh, we, don't, we don't see the live view there. Uh, but if I hit reshoot, then it will give me that live view again and just allows me to insert it here. Okay. If you have a um, if you have a frame that's going to be held for a while, like if you had a ball on the ground that's just being held there for a while, you can also go in and uh, hold a frame for a specified number of, of frames. So um, let's say that it needs to hold for six frames, right? That right there is that's, that's half a second. And so it's just basically repeated those. Now we don't want that. Um, I'm going to undo that. Uh, but if that was the case for you, you could do that. That way you wouldn't have to create a separate um, uh, picture for every frame. All right, so I'm just going to do a speed through now. And once we get toward the end, when we start to roll that ball on the ground, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that. Now, as I'm doing this, uh, you can see that I'm um, adjusting things with my, my Allen wrench, and it's because if I let that go, it starts to kind of fall over there. It's just the, the, the amount of weight and the distance that it's traveling there, it's a little bit uh, wonky. Um, I can hold this over here if I need to. My hand is pretty much out of the, uh, the range of anything that's going to be problematic. Um, I will just go in and erase that later the same way that I would erase the rest of the armature. So I can use this to hold something here if I need to. So just, uh, it's worth pointing that out. If you lose your live view over here in the cinematography section, just click on this button again and you'll get it back. Now it is becoming a bit of a pain to have to continually hold that. So what I might do is to go in and, um, move my, my rig a little bit. Um, the, where I place this now, I mean, I could put it more into the shot, potentially. It's going to cast some shadows there. What I might probably do is instead um, put it over here somewhere, just outside the shot on this side. Will that, will that be a problem? I'm not sure. Um, uh, it's still going to be a problem because it's going to be stretched pretty far. So yeah, it's going to be better to put it somewhere closer to it. We could actually even use, at this stage, potentially the shorter, um, the shorter one. All right, that would probably work pretty well. I'm just thinking about where it needs to go. Yeah, because uh, if we look at where the ball starts to roll, um, it rolls kind of like out here. So will that work? Eh, maybe not. Maybe we do need this longer one. So a lot of times it's just about getting the right planning in place. So right now it starts 
roughly there. Okay. Um, one thing that I, I, I didn't mention um, was about getting a nice uh, clean frame to begin with. And uh, let's, do, let's just do that now uh, while I'm talking about it and while I have this thing uh, unmoved. <laughs> so what we're going to do here uh, at this moment is just take a, 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 a clear picture of just our scene without anything else in it. And uh, we will place this um, right at the end for now. So this is just going to be, see, I was somehow I took that at frame 33. But we're going to put this all the way down here at the end. Um, so I just click and drag that to like frame 60 or so. That's fine. Um, we, we will need that uh, later on for the purposes of, um, of, of doing our edits. But for now, um, let's, uh, let's go back to where we, where we need to be. And so, there we go, press three, we lost our live view there for a moment. And, um, oops, to move our, move our camera position to frame 17 here where we are taking the photo now. There we go. Um, so we'll turn our ball back on and again, trying to make sure that this sits on the same level as the floor. It's probably pretty good there. Screw this back in. As you're doing this, you probably want to make sure that you're not accidentally um, damaging the, uh, the model. So maybe probably a better idea to actually take it off there while you're doing this. But I'm doing this fast for the sake of trying to get this tutorial done. OK, um, so come back in here. And now we will put this here. What we would not want to do is if we had a if we had a situation where we had multiple models overlapping each other, we wouldn't want there to be um, the armatures I I as part of that overlap, right? Because that would look weird. Um, so you know, armatures can sit in the scene so long as they're not sort of overlapping the action or casting shadows on the action in some weird way. Okay. This is, uh, right now, we, this, this one's a little bit more like an actual ball. So I'm going to take, I'm gonna take my, my weird turd one here. <laughs> and I'm going to roll it out a bit and make it more ball-shaped, but slightly elongate. So um, a little bit more like an egg now. It's a bit better. Not perfect. You can do a lot better. I'm just doing it fast. But you know, when you have limited time, you got to make things happen sometimes. All right. So um, again, focus in on that. This is also why it's good to uh, do a little bit of practice with this before you come in to do your your actual shoot, so you get used to how to work with the software, so you can work with it relatively quickly. Okay. Take that out. I'll just move that over here for now. Um, this one is getting uh, more rounded each time. So in fact, this is really, if you look at it here, it's actually just a ball. It's not even, not even flat anymore. Could probably round this one out even a little bit more. So put that on the ground. And make sure the dimple isn't showing there. There we go. Now we've gotten to a point where the ball is going to start to roll. So you can take that off of the armature. What's really important, I'm going to try to keep the ball in the same spot. I'm just going to try to pull the armature off. There we go. Okay. Um, I no longer need that armature there, so I'm going to remove it. One less thing to have to get rid of in my images later. Pull that over here. The more this gets used, obviously, the more there's these little holes that are going to appear and the more kind of dust and debris that's going to be there. So those are just little things you'll have to edit out later. 
But for now, what we'll do is we'll just start to, uh, to roll this. Um, and just a little bit by bit. I mean, you could do it where you try to actually make it look like it's rolling a little bit, which is it's a nicer effect if you can do that. Uh, what I find is it's, to get that to look right, you just try to physically roll it into position because that will be uh, the more likely uh, correct amount of rotation in that case. I'm just trying to make sure, make sure I'm not in the shot while I do that. It's very easy to kind of forget that you're in the shot. And just making sure that um, I've not gone out of focus here. Yeah, look good. Man managed to maintain focus pretty well throughout, so that's encouraging. All can start getting a little bit out of shape over time, so might have to adjust it ever so slightly. Those little last rotations are, you kind of have to push it into the table a little bit oop, <laughs> to get it to stay or take the photo quickly. Very nearly done there. I think our object doesn't look that much like a ball anymore. I would, if I were doing this like professionally, I would be a lot more observant about making sure that the, the ball continues to look right over time. Uh, but for a tutorial, I am sort of taking some uh, liberties with it. You notice know, it's very, 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 very minute adjustments right at the end. All right, so that now um, no longer moves. And what that means is that we can just hold this frame as we were doing before, as I mentioned before. We had a, we had a frame out here. I did a blank frame, which maybe I accidentally, oh, I must have actually, um, took a frame over it, that's okay. We can take a blank frame again right at the end. But for now, we're gonna hold this frame, this is at frame 52, and that's gonna be, what, uh, 12 frames, uh, 11 frames? So right click, choose hold frame for 11. No, I guess it needed to be, I guess it needed to be 13, sorry. I counted that completely wrong. Uh, hold frame for 13, very good. And then now what we'll do, clear everything out of here, make sure nothing's in that shot, and we'll just take that, uh, that final blank frame. And there we go. Now we've captured everything. Um, so you can have a little bit of a, a play through this. Um, all right, you can see it playing nicely through there. And it looks like it, now, this is interesting. Why did it why did it do the thing that it did? I think there may be an issue here. Um, okay, I can see. Let's just play through this again. I'm not sure why it was doing what it was doing. It gets to oh, I think I think what this is what it is here. Sorry. Didn't realize it, but um, for whatever reason, it kind of stops playing like around here. I think the playhead, there's these little um, yellow ticks here. And, and if you put those uh, at the end of the animation where you want it to stop, it'll stop there before the actual end of the animation. Uh, undo that. And if I were to play this again now, okay, now it's rolling to the end. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's much better. 
So we can go back and do what we had done, which was to hold this. Sorry, I got uh, I confused myself there for a moment, but that does happen. Hold frame, we set 13 frames. Again, take this final frame that we're on right now, it has nothing in it. There we go, cool. Now, um, you know, you really should be saving as you go through this. Ultimately, all of this uh, stuff is going to save as separate files within the directory that you had uh, created originally. So if I go back to that, that desktop and I go into that, that Dragon Frame folder that we had created, um, oops, sorry, Jason Kennedy, desktop, Dragon Frame, uh, this DGN file is actually a folder and inside that it will have um, all of the, the images that you have taken so far, all right? Um, including some stuff that you may not necessarily need to use. Uh, we'll talk about conforming files and all that in the, in the next lesson, um, but for now, this basically wraps up the, uh, the way that we approach just getting everything set up and, and working with our, with our scene. Um, so uh, if I were to check this again, um, change, make sure that this is playing back at 12 frames per second, and if we're to play this, we just turn off the, uh, the bouncing ball um, right there, and now we can actually see it playing through. All right, it looks a little bit weird there at the end where it starts to rotate after it's hit the ground because you can see that it hasn't been rotating in midair. I mean, a nicer little thing we could have done while it was bouncing was to um, go ahead and actually make sure it rotates while it's bouncing, but whatever. For, the, for our purposes here, this is a good enough place to start, and we would go in and delete out all of the, the armature stuff later on. So, but this gets, you, uh, this gets you started, and it definitely shows you um, the way that this, uh, this animation process works.